Good evening, uh, dear past presidents, council members, members of the IESL, family members of the late Professor E.O.E. Pereira, special invitees, guests. You all are welcome to Dean Professor E.O.E. Pereira Memorial Oration. Kindly uh, rise for presidential procession. As per the agenda, the first item is to light the traditional oil lamp. I cordially invite the following dignitaries to light the traditional oil lamp. President of ISL, General Dr. Kamal Laksiri. President elect of IESL, Professor Ranjit Disanayaka. Two past presidents, Engineer Chula de Silva and Engineer Pial de Silva. Our speaker today, Professor Mrs. K. G. N. Nanakara. A family member of engineer Professor E. O. E. Perera. Today, I invite engineer Hemal Piris to write the traditional oil lamp. Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunawardena, Chairman of Civil Engineer Section Committee. And engineer Neela Beseka, Chief Executive Officer. Kindly remain standing. I have uh, forgotten to uh, welcome our members who are joining online. I hope the son of late engineer Professor Eoi Perra is also joining. You are all are welcome. Well, the next item is to garland the statue of late engineer Professor Eoi Perra. I cordially invite President. Thank you very much. Kindly be seated. Now I invite the following dignitaries to the stage. President of ISL, Dr. Kamal Laksiri. Our speaker today, Professor Mrs. K.J. Nanakara. And engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunawardana, Chairman Civil Engineering Section. Our next item is delivering the welcome dress. I respectfully invite President of the Kamal Laksari to deliver the welcome speech. Good 
Good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to welcome you all on behalf of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka for the Professor EOE Perira Memorial Oration this year. Today, we have gathered here not only as members of a learned society, but as grateful citizens of this country to commemorate the 116th birthday of Professor EOE Pereira, a giant of engineering community. This event is one of the important events in the ISL calendar and is organized by the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee of ISL. Uh, first, now let me formally welcome all of you, starting with our guest speaker today, Professor Nadi, Mrs. Nadishani Nanayakara, Professor in Civil Engineering, University of Peradunia. Family members of the and relatives of the late Professor Yogi Pereira uh, who are joining online. They have, uh, they, they have joined online and others in the audience. Special invitees, President elect Professor Ranjit Dishanayake, past presidents, council members, members of the IESA joining in person and, and online. Chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunwadana, Chief Executive Officer Engineer Neil Abesekara, Deputy Executive Secretary Engineer Gunwadana, and the staff of the ISL, ladies and gentlemen. ISL being the premier body for professional engineers in the country, recognizes engineering giants who have rendered a remarkable contribution for the development and well-being of the profession, institution, and finally the country. Vidya Jyoti engineer Professor EOE Pereira, one such engineering giant in, this, in the history of engineering in Sri Lanka. He played a prominent role in the establishment of engineering faculty of, in the University of Ceylon and is also known as the father of engineering education of Sri Lanka. Professor EOE Pereira paved the way for all of us to become engineers. We would not have been sitting. We would not have been sitting here as engineers if not for the enormous contribution he rendered to the development of engineering education in the country. He was responsible for putting in place the foundation on which higher education in engineering in Sri Lanka is built upon today. Professor Eoe Pereira was born in 13 September 1907. He received his primary education at the Royal College Colombo, where he excelled in both academic, academics and sports. He won the De Soisa Science Prize, the, the Muhammad Ali Arithmetic Prize, Evans Prize for Mathematics. He shared it with uh, Dankton C. Obesekara, and he won House Colors for Cricket. Late President Jaya Jayadana, the first executive president of Sri Lanka and Ceylon cricketer Ennis Joseph were his contemporaries at Royal College. In 1928, he entered the University of College Colombo and graduated with a first class honors degree from the University of London, gaining first place in the Faculty of Science and winning a scholarship. The scholarship enabled him to enter Downing College, Cambridge, where he gained the dis distinction of being the only graduate to finish the three-year degree in two years. His contemporaries at the Cambridge included the late Mr. Dardi Senanayake, our former Vice Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. From the University of Cambridge, he graduated with first-class honors in Mechanical Sciences Tripos in 1931. Now, let me talk about his engineering career. Professor Pereira served in the Department of Public Works for 15 years before joining the teaching staff of the University of Ceylon in 1946. Called upon to provide leadership when the country decided to educate its engineers in its own soil, he had to literally start from scratch in establishing the first faculty of engineering in the country. At first, in temporary settings, starting at the Sloan Technical College at Maradana, and then in a shed at Thurston Road, premises of uh, now University of Colombo, before it found permanent accommodation at Peradini at the now Faculty of Engineering, premises of the University of Peradini. 
the fact that the fact that the University of London decided to withdraw its external BSc engineering degree being conducted up to that time at the Ceylon Technical College made the tasks entrusted to him all the more daunting. Not only did he have to hurriedly scramble the necessary academic staff, but also attend to the acquiring of the most appropriate equipment for the laboratory that was being built at the new faculty while was overcoming the administrative hurdles thrown across its path. But he achieved his goal successfully and reigned as the Dean of the Engineering Faculty for two decades before he was given the Vice Chancellorship of that university in 1969 as a crowning glory speaking volumes of his greatness. He was its first professor in, of civil engineering and the founding dean of the engineering faculty, University of Ceylon, at its inception in 1950. Then he was the chairman of the National Science Council and number of several government boards and commissions, including the Official Languages Commission and the Loan Commission. Professor Ferreira was honored with the title Vidya Jyoti in 1986 by the government. He died in 1988. The UOE Pereira, theater of the Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradina, was named to honor him. In addition to that, there are several awards are made each year in his name. I name few. The UOE Pereira Gold Medal at the Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradina. The annual UOE Pereira Memorial Prize for the Best Paper awarded by the IESL. The annual UOE Pereira Memorial Oration are few. So with that uh, brief introduction, let me conclude my introduction speech. And once again, I wish to welcome all of you to this important event. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. Let me have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Nadishani Nanakkar is a professor in civil engineering attached to the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Peradeniya. She obtained her B.S. Engineering degree from the Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradeniya in the year 2005, and her PhD from the National University of Singapore in year 2010, specializing in environmental science and engineering. Prior to joining the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Peradeniya in 2012 as a senior lecturer, she served the National University of Singapore and the National Institute of Fundamental Studies, Sri Lanka, for a brief period of time. The research interests include advanced water treatment technologies, material development for pollution control, and water quality monitoring. She has contributed to around 85 scientific publications, including 38 indexed journals and five book chapters. She is passionate, a university teacher, and a researcher who will continue to contribute to national development during her career. Her topic today is Art in Environmental Engineering, Science Engineering of Engineered Science. How to you, Madam? Yeah, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, Engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, President of the IESL. Engineer Professor Ranjit Disanayaka, President-elect of the IESL. Past Presidents of IESL and Council Members. CEO, Engineer Neela Besegara. Engineer Mrs. Kamala Gunardana, Chairperson, Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. Uh, other officers of IESL, family members of Professor Yoi Pereira who are joining online, academics of University of Peradeniya, distinguished guests, online participants. 
I am deeply privileged and honored to have received an invitation to deliver the engineer Professor Yoi Pereira Memorial Oration this year as we commemorate the 116th birthday of Professor Pereira, who is the pioneer of engineering education in Sri Lanka. As mentioned earlier, Professor Pereira demonstrated visionary leadership when tasked with establishing a new engineering faculty with an initial, initially proposed annual intake of only 25 students, he not only devised plans to accommodate up to 125 students, but also envisioned a faculty with 20 academic staff members and 25 instructors. His comprehensive vision extended to the construction of a facilities uh, in a proposal totaling an estimated 74,000 square feet of flow area and a footbridge across the Mahavali River and even housing for the faculty staff. As you can see in this slide here, the proposed plan encountered resistance and was not readily accepted. Criticism arose due to the request of 14 million rupees, which far exceeded the provided budget of only 3 million rupees at that time, resulting in numerous obstacles that needed to be overcome. After 14 years, uh, tough years, say, the battle to establish the Faculty of Engineering at Peradeni was accomplished. Professor Pereira established an environment where numerous individuals could flourish, transform their destinies, and contribute to the global community. Peradeni subsequently played a pivotal role in advancing engineering education in the country by consistently offering support without any reluctance in the establishment of new engineering faculties. Despite receiving numerous awards and honors throughout my career, I continue to regard the Professor Eloy Pereira gold medal I received on the day of my graduation in 2005 as the most esteemed recognition of my life. To be honest, I'm very proud of that award until today. And today I feel like, okay, I'm doing the second thing also in his name um, here. With this um, um, concise homage, allow me to transition to today's subject. Art in environmental engineering, whether it is a science, engineering, or engineered science, a topic which is deb debated over decades. Throughout the history, civil engineering has primarily concentrated on creating and building infrastructure to fulfill human requirements. However, as time has passed, we have become increasingly aware of the negative impacts of this development on the environment. Consequently, there has been a growing emphasis on taking environmental factors also into account. Now, it is just as crucial to apply engineering principles, scientific understanding, and inventive technologies to address the control environmental concerns and it is to develop infrastructure, as it is to develop infrastructure. As a result, the significance of environmental engineering has greatly increased over the past years. Here, you can see a few environmental engineering examples. It is not only limited to the usual, uh, you know, understanding water and wastewater treatment, it is renewable energy, say solar, wind, and hydropower. Waste management, which includes recycling, waste to energy conversion, and green building, sustainable architecture and construction, water and wastewater treatment, which may include advanced purification technologies, and uh, even air pollution control. So I have marked the specific 
region where I'm currently researched because I intend to draw examples from that field later on, which is water and wastewater treatment. Now, if you closely examine these examples, these examples reveal that environmental engineering is a diverse field that encompasses various branches of engineering, like civil, chemical, electrical, all these things. And fundamental sciences, physics, math, computing, chemistry, biology, all these things. And even some aspects of social sciences, because most of these things are directly related to your and my day-to-day -day life. Conclusion is, Environmental engineering is a highly multidisciplinary field drawing from diverse domains, attempting to categorize it into a single subject area would oversimplify its complex and integrated nature and thus the beauty of the same. Now in the current context, it is not just environmental engineering, but virtually any field whether within engineering or outside it, can be weaved as multidisciplinary in nature. Consequently, educational institutions should bear this concept in mind when preparing their graduates. The anticipated achievements of learners today have evolved significantly from those of the past. Even if you compare my days around 20 years back in the faculty, now it has completely changed. We have to change. Now let's have a look at the skills expected from a modern learner. Generation Z and Alpha, which is known to be difficult to deal with, to face the challenges of a fast changing world. So we have to prepare while we are from very different generations. Now here you can see 21st century skills, unlike our time as I mentioned before as well. The learner should be well equipped with learning, literacy and life skills. So learning skills, um, you know, um, here we have four learning skills, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, literacy skills, information, media, technology, life skills, um, flexibility, leadership, initiative, productivity, social skills, and so on. Now, if you look at the uh, accreditation manual of IESL for engineering degrees closely, which is actually prepared following the Washington Accord, um, that comprises 11 graduate attributes and incorporates nine knowledge and attitude elements within these attributes. These proficiencies are designed to equip graduates with skills relevant to the 21st century. Nevertheless, achieving the desired level of training for our graduates is a challenging endeavor, requiring a shift in the mindset of both students and mainly the academics. To accomplish this, it is necessary to alter the traditional perception of an individual's capabilities. To produce proficient environmental engineers, or civil engineers, let's say, or even engineers, we must transition from weaving individuals as having singular talents to recognizing them as, a, as possessing a range of abilities. This paradigm shift is essential. Based on traditional beliefs, individuals are thought to exhibit a preference for either a right brain or left brain personality. So you can see this nice, beautiful picture. Right hand side is more beautiful with lots of flowers, whereas left hand side is, you know, nodes and many elements. Individuals who lean towards right brain tendencies are often considered associated with creativity and qualitative mindset. Whereas those uh, who lean towards left brain tendencies, such as you and me, engineers, are typically characterized by their quantitative orientation. 
Now I can remember when I was a student, it was prohibited to say something is long. I had to mention how many meters, something like that. For example, while we like the details such as the span of a bridge, a qualitative mind might admire its architecture. However, based on a very recent report, which is published uh, in 2000, um, sorry, 2022, I have taken this figure from there actually. Um, the re report which is published in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2022 uh, from Harvard University. Emerging insights indicate that these divisions may not be as accurate as previously believed. Moreover, such divisions won't support the new developments in environmental engineering or any other field where more vibrant minds are required. Now, in Peradeniya, while these two categories are kept at two banks of the river Mahavali, there is a nice bridge which was proposed by Professor Ioi Pereira to connect them when and where required, possibly knowing the beauty of mixing each other. What I mean here is not a mere physical mix, maybe a mix of ideologies. In the late 1970s, artist and researcher Ned Herman introduced the intriguing idea known as the whole brain model. You can see that in this second picture, which I have shown here. Now this model identifies four distinct thinking preferences. You can see analytical, uh, practical, relational, and so on. Each corresponding to a specific quadrant as illustrated in the diagram. But while no single thinking preference is inherently superior to another, we have to keep that in mind. Every individual possesses the capacity and potential within each of these thinking preference quadrants at different levels. Now, for example, I might be good at analytical thinking, while my practical abilities can be slightly below that. But there is nothing like analytical thing is the best and practical and relational things are, you know, inferior to that. Now, if you work as an environmental engineer, as I always tell my students during lectures, it is essential to engage all four of these thinking quadrants as Herman recommends. Actually, there are ways to train our brain uh, in all these four quadrants. In a sense, you need to effectively utilize your entire brain, excelling in both mathematical and artistic aspects simultaneously. Now you might be thinking, why? Now before answering that question, let me show you some interesting definitions. Now when I was invited to this talk, I was thinking for more than a week without giving the title what I'm going to talk about. As someone who actually liked uh, art stream, which is in the other side of the campus, similar to my engineering, you know, whatever the profession which I'm practicing today, sometimes I regret not going to the other side of the campus as well. Now, uh, so when I was setting this title, I went through these definitions. Oxford Dictionary says, engineering, the branch of science and technology concerned with the design, building, and use of engines, machines, and structures. The same dictionary says, art, the expression of application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. I kept on reading and I found another very interesting definition, which uh, appears in Brijnika dictionary. These are again, the definition of art. Something that is created with imagination and skill 
and that is beautiful or that expresses important ideas or feelings. So here you can see I have um, highlighted few words, created, imagination, skill, beautiful, expresses important ideas. What do you think? After I read these lines very carefully, I was thinking, isn't this exactly engineering? Now, let me answer the question. Why do environmental engineers need to practice their whole brain? This is because environmental engineering is powered always by creativity and imagination. So I'm going to use a classical example from water treatment to prove this further. Now let's see this first diagram, which explains the process called osmosis. We all know this. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane um, here um, from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution. Water will move to make the concentrations the same on both sides of the membrane until it re reach, reaches the equilibrium. Osmosis does not require energy because the substances move down the concentration gradient from high to low concentration. Now our body cells do this process. Digestive system and kidneys are very good examples. So, so, so these things are very natural. You do not have to apply any, any energy. Then environmental engineers, you know, might, I don't know, might uh, got fascinated from this. And uh, let's move one step ahead. Now in the field of water treatment, reverse osmosis is widely employed. You all might have heard about RO systems. Now, some of you might be having them at your households as well. So this is widely employed with approximately 65% of the world's desalination relying on RO membranes. Now in this process of reverse osmosis, the natural phenomenon of osmosis. Now here in osmosis, okay, so after the equilibrium, there is something called osmotic pressure. Now in reverse osmosis, what we do is, we provide a pressure which is larger than osmotic pressure forcing water to move from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration. So we can produce fresh water out of highly concentrated seawater. Simple reversing of natural phenomena. Isn't this nice? This is nothing but the marvel of creative thinking. So are we going to stop here now? This is a well-established technology. There are issues, of course. Uh, people are continuously researching. You all know artists are perpetually discontent with their creations. They never get satisfied of them. Similarly, we environmental engineers as well. So as I mentioned before, for reverse osmosis, we need a considerable amount of energy to operate. We have to apply pressure uh, to reverse the natural process. The continuous thirst to resolve this issue has created new avenues in water engineering. The next emerging concept shown here in this picture is the forward osmosis. The idea behind this is to reduce the energy requirement compared to reverse osmosis. In forward osmosis, water is driven through a semi-permeable membrane from a feed solution to a draw solution due to the osmotic pressure gradient across the membrane. While there are a lot more challenges to be solved in this technology, this new technology will solve the issue of issues of high energy consumption, which we found in RO one day. Okay, and um, sadly, when I observe my students, primarily the recent graduates in civil engineering, who are very much tired now, grappling with concerns about their future and striving to emigrate. 
and when i witness my colleagues with nearly two decades of experience struggling to sustain themselves in sri lanka i often ponder where we may have made missteps where we have gone wrong along the way we must have done something wrong in my perspective as a civil engineer the root cause lies in our failure to recognize emerging trends and potential avenues we always walk down the easy path we remained entrenched in traditional sectors like construction leaving us vulnerable to market downturns as it evident today a very little shake in the economy can collapse the entire industry that is what we are going through now if we had diversified our industry by for instance instance allocating at least a quarter of it to product development and export the situation could have been considerably more favorable even today for example it is projected that the reverse osmosis membrane market size which was worth only around 3.35 billion usd in 2021 may grow up to around 8 billion usd in 2030 in another 7 years time now what should be our approach <clears throat> the approach is twofold first a very clear understanding be between industries and academia is needed a healthy dialogue focusing on what can be done and what cannot be done can be very useful second proposals need to extend beyond addressing routing challenges like treating your waste or effluent or checking water waste water quality we cannot stay at that level in this crisis situation instead the proposals should center on addressing global requirements and challenges our aspirations and dreams should surpass our immediate needs if you can remember my first few slides which was exactly the approach of professor yoi pereira someone might now inquire whether these proposals are attainable or if they remain confined to mere words to answer let's see a few examples which i have taken from our research work okay <clears throat> now here um, the very first example is based on my phd work during the year period 2006 to 2010 i have done these things in national university of singapore so my research was based on a industry funded grant focusing on product development and fund was a very rich organization of course maritime and port authority of singapore so i had to do big scale studies piloting and technology approval up to that and my phd actually generated the first um, you know um, uh, approved technology for ballast water treatment uh, from singapore now um, okay so bank scale that is science piloting engineering and technology which is engineered science so environmental engineering is actually ranging from science to engineered science let me give a very quick brief on what i have done there together with my team um yeah so um, the problem was the um, biologically ballast water is carried in ships it is primarily sea water so um, ballasting and deballasting process is done this is for actually keep the balancing of the ships now let's say if a ship fill the cargoes uh, from uh, a certain port say port 1 that always have organisms native to that port 1 and then they will go to a very different environment and then dump that deballast introducing the port 1 biological uh, agents into the second port probably 
to the second port environment, these agents can be invaders. So because of that, the International Maritime Organization has actually um, uh, published these uh, performance standards, which are shown here. So the research aim was to develop a suitable technology to treat ships ballast water. Now there, what we have done was we have investigated the electrochemical disinfection. And you can see the aspects I had to consider during my four years journey as a PhD student. And I was there for another, let's say one year as a, a researcher in the same laboratory before I come back to the country. So we have done materials development, corrosion inhibition, microbial activities. I had to learn all these things because microbiology, I didn't know anything at that time. Energy minimization, so a little bit of electricity also involved, a subject which I really disliked during my early undergraduate career. Reactor development and scale up, some chemical engineering was involved. Pilot scale tests, then I, we had to actually um, show that the receiving environment is safe because we are generating chemicals inside. Okay, so finally, I am most stamped this as a successful technology for ballast water treatment. You might be thinking, okay, all these things are in Singapore, right? A model country years back for us. So can we do, or maybe even can we think of some uh, similar work in Sri Lanka? So to answer that question, I have selected few more uh, work which we have done. Um, two cases which I'm going to report are actually limited to bench scale and little uh, scaling up only. The last one let's, uh, is more hopeful because we have a foreign collaborator. So the case one is CKDU. So anyone who is coming back to the country after doing a PhD in environmental engineering, probably the first thing to touch is CKDU. Now, um, if you focus uh, on the hypothesis, now most of the people are actually thinking uh, or maybe researching on causative factors. So if you look at this list, um, most of these hypotheses right, heavy metals, pesticides, hardness, fluoride, and um, algal toxins, salinity, all these things are related to the water, uh, drinking water quality. Now, I was thinking at that time, should I also focus on positive factors? I don't think so. It is not my specialty. We do not, actually, I, I, I do not like to cross the other people's borders. So I think that engineers' role and responsibility is always providing good quality water to the people, whether it is in a CKDU affected region or in any other place in the country. Now, uh, water administrators, including Water Supply and Drainage Board, have taken a lot of efforts, right, to provide good quality drinking water to affected areas. So here you can see um, CBO operated membrane based plants. Capacity is around 10,000 liters a day. Production is ranging between, let's say, 3, 4,000 liters a day. These are not actually supplied through pipes. People come to these uh, centers, and uh, you can see, I think, here in this uh, picture here, right? Um, they are actually filling their bottles for drinking and uh, cooking purpose. So uh, here you can see a general schematic diagram of plants. We have feed or raw water, pretreatment step, then membrane. So from the membrane, the, the clean water is what we call permeate here. And the reject waste, okay, so this is actually unfortunately about 50% of the feed. Then this permeate is disinfected, usually using UV radiation, and we generate the treated water. So in somewhere in 2016, um, um, all these studies from this point onwards are done uh, with a huge group consisting of uh, people from many different disciplines, right? Uh, mainly my students at Peradenia. 
and then people from waterboard and many many such places so the, here we have done some preliminary on site water quality tests first to get some understanding and we have noticed there are some problems in water quality and also recovery of plants less than 50% in majority of the locations so we are taking water out from groundwater sources and we simply waste half of that now after visiting these plants primarily my students identified many issues related to the system so they recommend we have to do comprehensive analysis of feed alternative water sources better groundwater management when it comes to feed water then uh, when it comes to membrane uh, whether we can do our own membrane development right they are really visionaries uh, whether we can fix operational issues they have identified a list of issues and can we go for other low cost technologies so all these problems they have identified permeate since we have seen some problems in product water they propose comprehensive analysis of permeate pre treatment they were having some doubts about the pre treatment efficiency and they were thinking whether low cost technologies can be you know uh, introduced and the waste water so we are rejecting the waste into the soil so whether we can actually have some issues there and so on so lot of lot of problems you can see i'm not going to talk about all these things actually we have touched at least 50% of these you know um, under investigation within these 6 7 years after this pilot uh, i mean basic study now we have actually conducted a comprehensive water quality analysis so we have to start it from somewhere so we have analyzed the feed water quality after pre treatment and product water primarily so here you can see some important parameters which we have measured there um we have realized actually several issues yeah some you know water was towards in uh, towards the acidic range and we have identified pre treatment is not effective in removing some parameters like hardness and fluoride and efficiency of removing toc using the system was questioned after our findings then we actually we have uh, started working on different aspects which i have shown you i'm going to share a few from um, this uh, a few solutions which our student were looked at or maybe have been looking at right uh, on this uh, pre treatment step um yeah so materials for pre treatment columns to solve uh, issues like fluoride and toc so i i have selected few studies so initially uh, okay so we started from fly ash because it is a waste material so some chemical modifications were done and it it it, it was a failure yeah after about let's say one and a half years of work um the finding was it can remove right uh, fluoride but only at very low ph values it is not going to be suitable for drinking water range right so um, okay it is matter of, matter of giving up versus trying again so our students picked the option of trying again right so here are some more outcomes of different you know student groups some of them have actually um, started working on uh, chitose and bio uh, biochar composite that works for fluoride removal so we have done lot of investigations they are published already and you know material you know safety all most all of these things we have checked uh, but we could not go to that um, you know the the final step the final uh, let's say product outcome and the second one here is chitosan hydroxyapatite another parallel group researched on this um so that one actually was very good at removing total organic carbon 
unfortunately or fortunately all most all these students who have worked for these projects are not now not in the country anymore they have left then uh, the second case now the first case is related to water treatment so you might have seen how much effort is needed um, and how creative you have to be right uh, for water treatment so how about wastewater so the next example is from uh, wastewater so i have picked a study which was done on electrochemical te technology for oil waste treatment um yeah so this electrochemical coagulation is very well known for removing oil from wastewater however the traditional technology does not support removing dissolved organic matter um, from uh, the dissolved things from a wastewater. So what we tried was whether we can do this oil and dissolved organic matter removal, uh, and the measurement is chemical oxygen demand in a single reactor by a single anode material. This is actually a challenging task. However, our students prepared anode materials to cater for both things in the same cell. And um, yeah, so here you can see some characterization things. Probably this thing is more uh, interesting, right? So here the visual observation itself shows. Okay, so this, this is actually not for uh, lab, a laboratory synthetic wastewater. This is using actual wastewater samples. So we have tested first the synthetic wastewater and then the actual wastewater. So uh, here this picture tells many things, but you know we are not sure about the quality of this thing, though it looks clean, but the test, tests were done, done. So here you can see our water is actually qualified uh, to uh, discharge into our water bodies according to the CEA guidelines. And this particular student also not anymore in the country. Now the case number three. So we have so far looked at uh, uh, drinking water and wastewater. And the next one is storm water. This is the last case study I'm going to present today. Um, yeah, so this idea of using biochar based functional concrete material for uh, urban runoff quality improvement came into my mind and I discussed it with some of our collaborators in uh, Australia, RMIT. Mm. So to start a joint PhD program. Uh, so I had a good student in my mind as well. So we discussed this thing and the collaborators also, you know, fine with the idea. And then we started, started it somewhere in 2019, uh, before Corona. I think. So the idea was to remove heavy metals from urban runoff. Our focus was heavy meters um, using biochar. Uh, you know, the biomass can be a fatty husk or sawdust. And uh, the team actually had uh, one from agriculture engineering as well. So that we can do a beautiful final design. We need a lot of brains. And uh, here you can see the uh, pyrolysis reactor which is actually found in Faculty of Agriculture, Peradenia. And here you can see the uh, sawdust and paddy husk biochar, closed pictures which were taken using scanning electron microscopies. Now this part of the work was done in Peradenia. Okay, so two years we work here and the last year student moves to Australia. So these things were done in our laboratories. Now here, uh, then actually after we done a lot of tests on these biochar materials, we have selected one and then we incorporate that into a cement. Where my knowledge is not sufficient, insufficient. So I had to, you know, work with people from concrete technology as well. So we, he, the, the student is, uh, he has actually five supervisors from five different areas. So his life might be miserable. Then, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were able to come out with good results. So then we have designed columns also in our laboratory here. A mm, lot of inputs were came from our MIT site as well. So we work together. 
And then here um, you can see a small scale. First, we have you know prepared the composite with sufficient permeability to directly send uh, the storm water down if we use this material for drainage. And uh, we have done a lot of studies and uh, sorry, here you can see um, some of the results. Now this PhD is towards the last few months. Um, so now the next step is product development. So I think uh, we will, you know, discuss further with the collaborators uh, on this particular matter. Okay, so whether we can go for the next step because the results are promising. Um, and again, this particular student also know going Sri Lanka. So we can see the trage tragedy, right? Now I have listed the major contributors to this work. Okay, so I have 21 more years to serve in the country. So I have to think about new things, directions. Um, okay, so my students were always fascinated, right? So can we think of developing membranes? Yes, let's do it. However, still we do not have all the facilities, even the chemicals at this moment in our lab, but concept we have started working on. So one would think, okay, flat sheet membrane, which is not the new technology, RO, low pipe, everything is there, yes. Those things are there, but we have to start from somewhere. So at the same time, now we are experiencing everyone, every researcher who is in, in environmental engineering is facing a huge challenge because of the price escalations in uh, chemi chemicals and tests. So uh, they are usually costly and the, now the cost is even uh, three, four times higher than that was before. So we were thinking, okay, why can't we think of cutting down the experiments and utilizing or moving more towards computational tools uh, to minimize the expenses and to optimize and analyze treatment technologies, reactors, and performance. And it is challenging because we do not have touched this particular area of studies before in our laboratories. However, as I always mention, Okay, again, another group of students have taken this challenge, learning software and coding alone, and now they are into this as well. Okay, so now I'm uh, moving towards the very last few slides. I know it is very difficult to listen for longer than 30, 40 minutes. Okay, so, um, so here I thought of including opportunities and challenges which we may encounter during uh, proposed journey. But at the same time, I wanted to highlight the fact that a new product development in this field of engineering may take years of tedious experimenting, hard work, and more importantly, investments as well, while taking a risk of possible failure. However, the possibilities in product development and creative new industries are very high. Um, yeah, so now let's have a look at the opportunities and challenges. Um, opportunities, competent students. Believe me, we have a very brilliant lot of students with us who might be very different from us back in 30, 40 years, maybe even 50 years from now. They can be very different, but that difference is the beauty. And we have well-trained academics in Peradeniya. Uh, we have nine faculties. And name a field, we have expert. And active collaborations, we already have some, right? And basic infrastructure, let's not complain about things we do not have. We have a lot of infrastructure. And also growing environmental issues, which is a benefit for us to work. And I consider this fallen economy also a opportunity. At least we started thinking as civil engineers whether we are walking along the correct path or not, right? Now, uh, though I personally do not like complaining about challenges, that is the reality, you know, so the reality cannot be disregarded. So here are the challenges. Lack of awareness. 
industry doesn't know what we do when we do not have much idea about what the industry needs majority of the times unless we reach them or they reach us lack of willingness reluctant to share i have a lot of you know bad experience in sri lanka right? especially when it comes to data sharing knowledge sharing may be up to some extent but data sharing i know some organizations having you know maybe thousands of data in their files and uh, without analyzing and not willing to share as well. so this culture we will have to change and uh, the academics today are too busy i don't know right so too busy so that we do not have much time to think of uh, you know new things let's say so i actually had the chance to uh, NUS once nominated me uh, uh, when I was a student there to represent them uh, for a workshop in Japan, where I had uh, actually that is a, that was a golden opportunity for me to stay there uh, for about five days camp with Nobel Prize winners, Japanese Nobel Prize winners. So they they are actually uh, discuss this matter a lot. now academics are going behind number of papers rather than science or real academic matters teaching and all these things so i have observed that in our, our society as well which we need to change and our systems are less flexible maybe due to reasons but this less less flexibility make our life miserable and delays in decision making sometimes believe me even after we receive a foreign grant after they accept our proposal to bring money to the university it might take one and a half years plus sometimes so at by that time the donor might you know having difficulties and they start asking us why this is we are giving money to you why can't you accept and lot of issues and funds we have to solve these challenges um yeah so here i am coming to the very last slide maybe um finally we need one more thing to be a successful environmental engineer so what is that that is that is nothing but passion so to wind up i thought of sharing my first ever publication as per my opinion which was done back in 1985 when i was a grade 1 school kid right so this is that yes thank you thank you very much madam for your informative uh, speech we wish that you would be able to meet those challenges and go forward our uh, next item is to uh, pay the tribute to our resource person i may now uh, invite our president dr kamal laksri to give away the token of appreciation to our resource person thank you much president our last item today is giving away the word of thanks i cordially invite dean mrs kamala gunawardena chairman civil engineering section committee to give away the word of thanks
past presidents and vice presidents council members members of the council members of the institution I hope they are joining online and friends of the late Professor Yoi Pereira and the CEO of the Nilabi Center and the Deputy CEO and the staff of the IECA. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, today, as the chairman of the Civil Region Section Committee, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here this both of us and uh, to extend my gratitude towards the presenters and the attendees here. This is the 115th anniversary and of the late Professor Joey Pereira. Today's memorial. Oration was about art in environment in engineering, science, engineering, or engineered science. Professor Ferreira's teachings emphasize the importance of responsible environmental management and sustainable development, and he advocates that environmental engineering provides the necessary expertise to address these challenges effectively. Our speaker today expressed this very politely and effectively. She intended that she now faces numerous environmental challenges that require sustainable attention and immediate solutions. Actually, she expressed all those in a very well summarized, very quick going into her different areas of her situation. She finally gave a very good message to the academias, academias and the uh, industry how to go forward. So thank you for that. Uh, actually, I'm here to do my own of thanks completely. First and foremost, I express my deep gratitude to our speaker for your mention again. Your valuable insights and words of wisdom have enriched the atmosphere of this oration of the memorial lecture of the Yoyo Pereira, Professor Yoyo Pereira. So, I think our engineers will pay more attention towards the environmental engineering and how to work up with that in the industry and the academia simultaneously. The president, president elect, past presidents, and the council members. Thank you. Thank you for your directions and initiatives. Of course, our members of the CG Sectional Committee. Thank you for being with us. And we should not in this let you make a success like in this nature. Right? I would also like to extend my appreciation to the Citizen Secretary and the staff of the ESL who work with immensely to ensure the smooth production of this event will. I take this opportunity to thank the family of course baby and my children and the colleagues and the colleagues who attended this event this very year. Finally I wish to thank all those who have participated in this event physically here and on the Zoom platform. In the spirit of Professor Pereira's teaching, we must prioritize environmental engineering to protect its natural resources, mitigate the effects of climate change, and ensure sustainable development, which will contribute to the long term well being and restoration of the nation. 